All right, so we are here today talking about McKinney Vento homeless education. Um, I am the state coordinator for the state of Maine for this program and so sincerely appreciate you all being here and making time to talk about this today. So to kick us off, I have some really exciting good news. We have a new we have new funding that's available for families um, through this pilot program in the main state budget that came out in July. So this is up to $750 per student that schools can access for students who are facing homelessness. So this funding can be used um, for housing needs like rental assistance, utilities, and critical home repairs. And schools can access this one time a year per student for two years. We have $3 million set aside for this program, $1.5 million each year. So if you have a student, if you know of a family with children who are in school, who are dealing with any of these issues and there's no other way to find them that support for rental assistance, utilities, or critical home repairs, definitely make sure they check in with their McKinney Vento liaison at their school district and that person may have access to this funding to get them connected. You can also always reach out to me and I can connect you to folks. We have a link to look up the local liaison. I will put that into the chat um, in just a minute here. All right, any questions on this? Feel free to just jump in or pop things in the chat as you, as you, um, as we go along. Okay. The other thing I wanna highlight for you all is we do have regional meetings two times a year around the state of Maine. And this is where we invite folks who are working with families who may be experiencing homelessness to come together and really problem solve together. So we have um, meetings in Saco, Lewiston, Augusta, Presque Isle, Bangor, and Machias. Um, and we bring together our school district liaisons and a lot of other community um, community-based organizations. We have some training. We, we talk about some tricky situations and it's just a really good time to come together and learn about other resources that may be available in the communities. So we have the link. There is a link. You can Google, you know, McKinney Vento meetings and it'll pop up for you, but I'll post that link and send that out after as well to everybody. All right, so just to clarify here, we do have um, educational, there's some specific educational rights for these three different populations. We have students who are in foster care who do have educational rights. So if DHHS is, um, if they are in the custody of DHHS, they have a right to remain in their same school, even if they're placed out of district with another family and receive transportation from the school so that they can continue in that same school and have one less disruption in their lives, right? Keep their contact with their teachers, their friends, their programs, like after school stuff and um, their credits, especially as well for our high schoolers. So for foster care, Julie Smythe is our contact at the, at the DOE for any questions about students in foster care and their education. Um, and then every public school district in our state and in our country has a local foster care district contact as well. So every public school district has someone who's specifically there to support students who are in foster care in their district. Um, and we have a lookup for those folks that I will pop in the chat. So foster care is one piece of this. And then there's another part that's McKinney Vento, which is very, very similar, but it's for students who are not in foster care, not in DHHS custody, but who are experiencing homelessness. And we will get into some of those definitions because our definition of homelessness is really, really broad, which is wonderful because it encompasses a lot of families and students who um, may not even consider themselves homeless and may have a roof over their head but are temporarily housed or inadequately housed and would qualify for additional support through their schools. Um, one other component of this is the educational surrogate parent, which is really confusing and not my role at all, but I'm happy to refer you to Sarah if this is an issue you run into. And this is when we have students who are unaccompanied um, and have special education needs. And Sarah is really the contact to make those, um, to get those those students supported. 
All right, so I do wanna know, would you mind popping in the chat how familiar you are with McKinney Vento from a zero to a five? Zero, never heard of this before. Five, I've been doing this a long time. I know all of it. All right, I see a one, three, ooh, three and a half, Melissa. Nice, I like that precision. One, two, zero, yay. Some zeros, threes, lots of zeros. Twos, beautiful. Okay, used to work in the school system. Awesome, thank you. Great, all right. So we're coming in on the lower end of things. My hope is for the end of today, the end of this hour, everyone will move up a couple numbers here and feel a little more secure in what they know about McKinney Bento. Um, and so I'm. this topic is really hard, right? I mean, you all are, are more than well aware of the difficulties that our students and families are facing in our state every day. Um, but the thing that I like about sharing this as a resource is that it is a resource. It's something we can do in every part of our state, right? Anywhere that you have a public school district, you have this built-in support for students experiencing homelessness and there's funding to go along with it, right? So a lot of times when we work with families um, in schools and we have, you know, students that we know who don't have a home to go to, who ran away, were kicked out, you're, where you're worried about the condition of the home they're going to, or you know they don't have one of their basic utilities, um, or the home is overcrowded, or maybe they're going to stay in a hotel or motel with five people in one hotel room, right? These are all situations where a lot of us, especially a lot of us educators, feel our heart breaks for this, and we feel really helpless, right? Because what are, we're just going to worry about it. There's nothing we can really do, or we're spending our own money, which is not much with our state salaries or our school district salaries, to meet the basic needs of these students, right? And so all of this is to say McKinney Vento is out there to help these students so that in all these kinds of situations, there's other support available that can meet those needs. And this support has been around, it's federal law, and it's been around since 1987. It's not new, but it is newly funded, I will say, because historically we get about $300,000 per year for the entire state with COVID funding. Um, and with the DOE prioritizing this, we got $10 million out to school districts specifically to support students experiencing homelessness. Um, McKinney Vento is a mouthful. It's awkward to say. It's named after the two legislators who were really instrumental in getting this passed, um, Stuart B. McKinney and Bruce Vento. But people mix it up all the time. One time I had someone say Mackenzie Venmo. No joke. Like that one's my favorite of all of them so far. But I try to just say like MV or McKinney because that's a little bit easier. Um, some people will talk about it as the homeless program. I really caution folks with that because so many families who do qualify won't identify themselves with homeless. And um, that, that word can be kind of off-putting for folks, right? So part of this federal law requires that every state has a state homeless education coordinator. That's my role and that's what I do at the department. So I provide technical assistance, manage some funding and provide um, whatever districts need to better be able to understand this law and how it applies in their communities and with their particular students. Whoops. Um, so everyone has a McKinney Vento liaison. Will you put in the chat a yes if you know who your local liaison or one local liaison in your community is? And put a no if you don't too, actually. And then I can have a second to grab the link for us. All right, I'm seeing some no's. So this is a great activity to do. No yeses, huh? Wow, lots of no's. Okay, so go to this site and pop in your town or like your primary town, and that will show you who your local person is in your local school district to connect with for McKinney Bento. And now how do I find my screen again? Whoops. All right. And some school districts have more than one person where they might have a building point of contact as well. 
but each district is required and does have a McKinney Vento liaison in every school district in the state. And so when you go to that website, this is what you see. You select your town and then the person's name will pop up with their contact info. So if you know of families right now who are in some kind of temporary living situation, connect with your local liaison and say, hey, I'm working with this family. Are they on your radar? I think they could be eligible for McKinney Vento, right? And then you don't have to be the one to make that determination. You just make the referral. Um, it's up to the liaison to figure out the details of eligibility. And so when I talk about McKinney Vento, I like to talk about it as um, with this first true story. So we have a true story. We have a young person. I'm going to call her Brittany. Um, she shows up at a new high school and she comes to enroll from a nearby district. And it's clear that she hasn't showered. Her clothes are really wrinkled. She's really, really tired. Um, but she does start attending school. Very quickly, her attendance starts to decline. The school tries voicemails, texts, letters home. There's no communication. And then eventually through the, through the grapevine, you hear that the student is pregnant and she's officially withdrawn from school, right? So that's our first story. And I want us to pause there on the first story and then go to a second story about what else could have happened up to this point, right? And so we come in with the same exact story. Brittany shows up to a local high school to enroll. She hasn't showered, her clothes are wrinkled, she's very, very tired. But in this version, the first page on her enrollment paperwork to start school is this. This is the McKinney Vento screener form. And so it asks these two little, two little, little questions, I'll say. Um, where do you and your family currently live? And if you don't live in your own home with immediate family, then you go on to section B. If you do live in your own home with your immediate family, you check off that box and you're done. You don't have to do anything else. And so Brittany looks at this and she says, oh, yep, I'm section B. I'm staying temporarily with friends, relatives, or other people couch surfing, right? So Brittany fills out this form. She submits that to her um with her enrollment paperwork, this leads to a referral to the local liaison. The local McKinney Vento liaison would chat with her about um, McKinney Vento, about her situation, and make a determination, right? And so in this version, she sees that screener form, and then the liaison would say, okay, Brittany, you're eligible for this program called McKinney Vento, um, which means you have some special rights for your education. The first one is really you have a right to either stay in your same school, even if you're temporarily living out of district, or to enroll immediately in the new school, even if you don't have normally required documents like immunizations or proof of guardianship or residence or whatever it may be, right? And so Brittany, for most students, Brittany says, I'd rather stay in my old school and receive transportation. It's only the next town over and I have all my friends, my community, everything I want there. And this is just a temporary situation, right? Um, that is what McKinney Vento presumes is going to be in the child's best interest. But sometimes students will say, you know what? I really, um, I had a bad thing going there. My cousins are there. I got, there was a lot of trouble. I don't want anything to do with that. Let me start new in this new community. And when that happens, they have a right to immediately enroll in that new school, even though they're not going to have proof of residency, right? She doesn't have a place where she's getting mail at, at her friend's house where she's couch surfing, all of those kinds of things. So Brittany says, I want to stay in my same school. She gets set up with transportation. She gets support. You know, actually, I really need some help with clothing. She gets sneakers for gym class. She gets free meals boxes of food on the weekends, referrals for medical, mental, dental health, um, tutoring, referrals for housing and support with that, maybe family mediation, whatever it might be, um, winter gear, school supplies, access to things like shower and laundry, because schools, most schools have these in their buildings, right? So Brittany can get a ride, she can get into school early, and she can use the locker rooms before other students arrive, right? Where she can do laundry, she can access the showers. And maybe Brittany gets an extra locker where she can store her belongings, right? Because she's right now she's doubled up with somebody else. She really doesn't want to be a burden. She's really aware of how much space she's taking up, or maybe she doesn't feel like her stuff would be safe there, right? 
And then the school can even provide support with things like cell phones and my fis you know, Wi-Fi devices and all of this to make sure that Brittany can stay connected and communicate if she's out sick one day, right? And so when we look at the difference between the first story and the second story, look at all of this support that Brittany was able to access because she was identified as McKinney Vento, right? And we are doing a lot, a lot throughout our state to continue to raise awareness about this program and get students connected to the services to which they are entitled under federal law, right? And there's money to back it up. That's the great part. And now with this new $750 thing, she could also get $750 to help maybe to for, I wanna say like a car repair, right? Something that's needed for her to be able to get transportation to and from school every day, whatever it might be. Um, so this is the second story of what could have happened. When we go back to the first true story of what happened to Brittany, um, we left off where she was pregnant and she had dropped out. She was officially withdrawing from school, right? Brittany um, went on to her local adult education center. She got her GED, her high set, and she's a proud mother. And now she serves on the main youth action board out of New Beginnings, advising homeless programs statewide about how we can do better for students like her and for students where she was never identified for McKinney Bento in all of her years with unstable housing as a kid. Um, but she certainly would have benefited from it so, so much if, if she had been identified. And so the Maine Youth Action Board is an amazing group of young people with various lived experiences with different systems. And they advise a lot of programs around our state about how we can do better for young, for young people and how we can improve um, our communication, everything, authentic youth engagement. Our website is fully vetted by the Youth Action Board. All of our presentations, all of our forms and flyers, anything we put out, they have to approve it first. And so when I chatted with them, um, one of them, one of the young people said, Amelia, when you talk to, when you talk to folks about McKinney Vento, please tell them that my mom was doing the best she could. She was working three jobs and we still didn't have a stable place to live, right? I know I'm preaching to the choir with this audience. You all are very familiar with this, but for a lot of people, this is not a part of their daily lives and what they see every day. So there is sometimes a component of these presentations that have to be breaking down the stigma, right? And building that compassion for families who may be in temporary living situations. So when we look at um, how vulnerable are we to experiencing homelessness, there's a few questions here to consider. Could you experience some natural disaster, right? A hurricane is coming, <laughs> who knew, right? There's all these kinds of things that could happen to us, no matter our socioeconomic status, no matter how secure we feel in our home, that could still happen, right? Your pipes could freeze and burst. You could have a tree fall on your house. There's so many things that would make your home inhab uninhabitable. Um, I have a dear friend whose house just burned down, right? There's all of these things that can happen to anybody at any time. And it's really, really important to shift that narrative of this is a program for those kids over there to seeing this is a community program for all of us because it says that this could happen to anyone. And when and if that does, our kids are gonna be safe and secure and being able to continue in their school, right? No matter what's going on at home. The one I always, highlight here is our housing costs in your area increasing faster than wages because no one has ever said no to this question right like everywhere housing costs we are in an affordable housing crisis in our state that is the reality um when we break down the numbers by population maine is actually eighth in the nation for homelessness just like that's a really high number i was not anticipating that when i um first started getting into this work, right? And so I want to take a moment and ask, just in your head, just have a personal moment of reflection. If your home was flooded and no longer was available, where would you go, right? What would you do in that situation? And um, think about that place, have that place in your head. For me, that would be my mother's house, right? I know that I would have, she would have room, 
she would have enough room for us to fit in there. I would feel comfortable. I wouldn't feel too, too much like a burden. And that would be a place that I'd feel safe and comfortable, right? Um, for most of us, we would say, you know, my sister's house, my neighbor's house, my best friend's house, right? Somebody that we love and care for and we know would care for us in that situation, right? Some of us might say, you know, I'd rather go stay in a hotel or a motel or whatever the options might be. But when you think about that place, and last time, last time I did this, I said, I said, yeah, I'd pack up my kids and my pets and we'd go to my mom's house. And my colleague was in the audience and she's like, don't forget your husband. What are you talking about? <laughs> oh, God. So, uh, yes, whole family. We would go to my mom's house. That would be my place. Right. And when you think about your place, is that in your same school district? Right. Mine's not. My mom's up by Wiscasset and I'm in Topsom. That is not the same school district. That was not my priority when I was thinking about where am I going to feel safe and comfortable, right? And so that's where most people in these kinds of boats, that's not going to be our first consideration. But I sure as heck am going to want my kids to be able to stay in their same school with their teachers that they adore while this all this upheaval is up in the air and we don't really know what's happening, right? And so this is why I really, really try to focus in on talking about this program as an essential backbone to our schools and communities that really says any of us can come across hard times if and when that happens, our schools will be there to help our kids, right? Like, that's pretty cool. A lot of other countries in the world do not value this, right? If you can't pay for your kid's uniform to go to public education, your kid can't go to get their public education in a lot of places. But it's really, really nice that the, that our government has decided this is enough of a priority, and especially all the way back in 1987. Um, it's just, I think it's a really cool program. And I'm always, always happy to talk to anyone who will listen about it, because I think it's a under, under identified and underutilized resource that we have in our state. Um, so one way to think about this is, is your housing situation making it hard to succeed in school or for your kids to succeed in school? because our definition is so, so broad. So we'll get into some of those specifics. So our federal definition says that homelessness is lacking a defined, uh, sorry, is lacking a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence, which I think is like really awkward language and not how I normally speak in my daily life, right? But fortunately, they gave us some more examples of what that actually means. Can the student go to the same place every night to sleep in a safe and sufficient space? If the answer is no to any one of those bubbles, then the student would be eligible for support through the McKinney-Vento program at their local school. And so we also get into some specifics. Um, so it provides that definition, and then it has specific scenarios that would also be eligible. So this one, sharing housing due to a loss of housing, economic hardship, or similar reason, right? This is the majority of our students. This is where I said I would go. I would go share housing with my mother due to a loss of housing, right? Home was no longer available to me. Do you know families who are in this situation right now? Will you raise your hand or put a yes in the chat? All right, I'm seeing their hand raised. Yeah, thank you, Paige. Christine and Kim, awesome, thank you. Write down those names. And make sure you make a note to connect with the liaison, right? They're entitled to some extra support from their schools. So that's one of them, sharing housing due to a loss of housing. That's also called doubled up couch surfing. There, those are the other ones. Um, the next one is living in hotels or motels due to a lack of adequate housing, right? This is not going on vacation. This is you have nowhere else to go. So you're staying in the local hotel, right? You raise your hand if you know students in this situation right now or put a yes in the chat. This is this one has increased a lot, a lot since COVID. All right. Yes. Oh, look at those yeses coming in. Yeah. Hands raised. Yep. That's a big part of our students who are identified now. Um, in previous years, not so much, but definitely since 2020, that number has significantly increased. Um, the next one is staying in trailers or camping grounds due to a lack of adequate housing. So my brother, true story, I feel, in these trainings, I'm always telling everyone like my entire life story by the time like you will know so much about me by this hour is over. 
uh, my brother lives in an RV in a fifth wheel with his family and their dog and they travel all over the country and that is what they do, right? They do like the whole Instagram thing. They are not eligible for McKinney Vento support. If my brother comes to me and says, hey, we just got evicted. We have nowhere else to go. Can I park my RV on your lawn and stay here? Yes, then they would be eligible for McKinney Vento support, right? There has to be some kind of crisis that occurs it, that shows that it's due to the lack of adequate housing, that there aren't um, other pieces to it. And then we also have what a lot of people think for homeless of living in emergency or transitional shelters. Right. So domestic violence shelters, youth shelters, uh, family shelters, any of those at any point since July 1 of this year, they would be eligible for the duration of the school year. And then we have what people think of the unsheltered. So this is what most people think when they think homeless. This is staying outside, staying in cars, parks, public spaces, abandoned buildings. I had one DHS office. Um, tell me that was their parking lot right now when they came in um, when they came in every day that there were a lot of families that were staying out in the parking lot and then another one that's really important and not fully um, like understood is substandard housing so if we have someone who's staying in a house that would not pass local building codes that has been condemned that's been infested with vermin, pests, mold, anything like that, that doesn't have a working kitchen or a working toilet, if it presents a danger to children or adults, all of these things doesn't have adequate heat. It would be eligible for McKinney Vento, even though they have a roof over their head. And it could be that, that they've lived in that house their whole life, right? But if the house is not adequate, then it's going to still be eligible under McKinney Vento. And that's where we get into this kind of weirdness of like, but this is called the homeless program, right? That's not really homeless, but it's saying that home is not adequate, right? So raise your hand if you know families in that in that boat right now. If you don't raise your hand, I'm gonna be shocked. And I'm gonna say, go for, go for a drive. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, and then the last one we have is migratory students. So these are the children who have family members working in agriculture or fishing. These are kiddos who follow the crops around the country and the state uh, because their parents are working the good people who get us our fruits and vegetables every day, right? So this is a picture of the blueberry barrens down east, um, but we also have apples, we have potatoes, we have fishing, fish processing, all of that work that's eligible and often has employer provided housing. I have visited most of the farm labor sites in our state, and I will tell you, none of them would be considered adequate for our definition of McKinney-Vento. Um, Department of Labor has their definition, which that's their thing, but for us, definitely not. And so why do we do this for kids? Why do we bother identifying them, right? Like this is so heartbreaking to hear about all these really tough places that students are living. And the answer is look at all of this good stuff that they can get from their schools once they're identified. So we talked about most of these already, staying in the same school, getting transportation, getting support with school supplies, with clothing, with hygiene items, lots of referrals. They can get into other programs. They can be prioritized for those programs. Um, early childhood, like Head Start, early Head Start, that um, all of that stuff would be prioritized. And then my favorite one here, is this how I do this? Yeah. Other extraordinary or emergency assistance needed, right? Like what federal language gives us that much flexibility specifically written into the law is not much, especially in the education world, right? And so this is really saying we, we can never predict all of the barriers that a child might have to accessing their education when they're in unstable housing. But this, it is the school's responsibility to remove those barriers if, they, if there are barriers to them accessing their education, right? So we had a student, we had two young students, not young, but like middle school, who went to their teacher, they were McKinney Vento eligible, and they said, we really need bathing suits to be able to keep coming to school. The teacher was like, ah, oh, this, I don't really like, uh, tell me more, right? But you can tell she's thinking like, how, how in the world am I going to justify this one, right? 
And the student said, we're living in a congregate living situation where the showers are shared and open. And we do not feel safe taking a shower in front of the other people who are staying there. And if we're not taking showers, we are definitely not coming to school, right? And so once we had that information, we were able to justify the purchase of, of bathing suits for these children because that was a barrier to them accessing their education. But without that information, you know, straight face test, you're like, no, of course not. That, that would be an extra thing. Maybe they needed that bathing suit to do gym class when it's the swimming lessons, right? That is a barrier to them accessing their education. It's so, so broad and can be, and is so case by case specific, but that funding is there. All schools are required to set aside Title I Part A funding for students experiencing homelessness. And then schools now have access to the $750 per student fund that we have as well. Um, so our services, so once you're designated eligible for McKinney Vento, that stays with you for the whole school year, because again, our goal is some kind of educational stability. We don't want to uproot a kid in the middle of a school year. Um, we want to keep them in that same school around the adults that they know and trust. And then we have students who are eligible year after year after year, right? Um, if you, we had a family, they were in a shelter one year, the next year comes around, they're still in that same shelter they are still going to be eligible, right? It is up to liaisons to make that determination every year and revisit um, eligibility. And I should have updated this for you, but I didn't yet. This is the trend that we've been seeing over the last 10 or so years. Um, our numbers are increasing significantly since COVID. For the end of 2023, we actually had 4,400 students identified in our state as McKinney-Vento eligible. So, Historically, we'd been at about the 1400 mark for a while, and now we're up to 4400. Um, I say this with pride because we knew these kids were already out there, and now we're just actually getting them connected to the services, right? A lot of people hear that and they say, that's so sad. This is increasing so much. Yes, it is increasing. And we already knew that there were students who weren't being identified. Um, National estimates tell us that we should be identifying between three to 5% of our student population that experiences homelessness in a given year. Um, and especially with our child area poverty rates, that would be closer to the 5% side. And we've been identifying about 1% for the last 10 years. So we have a ways to go, right? Um, and when we look at the breakdown, you can see the majority are doubled up in that sharing housing situation. The next one is hotels, motels, and then we have shelters, and then the black sliver is the unsheltered. So fortunately, that unsheltered piece is a very small percentage of the students that we identify. Um, and when we talk about this group, a lot of people think that when we talk about McKinney-Vento homeless children and youth, that we're talking about high schoolers who are on their own, right? Um, people assume that it's the high schoolers that are in this situation and that get identified the most. But it really is families who are who are experiencing homelessness as families and with um, their young children. One of the theories is that the younger children will tell you everything, right? They'll show up to school and say, "We, I slept in the car last night with my mom, right? Compared to a high schooler, knows they're not supposed to say that. They don't want to get their mom in trouble and whatever other layers there might be to it. Um, but it is really important to remember, this is not just young adults that this is happening to. Um, actually, the time you're most likely to experience homelessness in your life is when you're preschool aged. That is the majority. Um, our, our numbers don't reflect that because we don't, well, there's a lot of theories on that, I would say, because we don't have good enough public pre-K to really have the connections with our local education agencies. But um, we're working on it. We're working on our collaboration with Head Starts, Early Head Starts, and Child Development Services. And when we look at this population of students, um, we're about 15% multilingual learners. So um, we do have a lot of immigrant students who qualify and meet this definition as well. Quick reminder, all children present in the United States are eligible for a free appropriate public education, right? You do not need to have any kind of immigration status or documentation to be able to enroll in your local public schools. Um, and this is a federal education program that is a part of that public education. 
so students can qualify. We do not ask anything about immigration. We are seeing an overrepresentation in special ed for this population. Um, and then we have about 17% of our McKinney-Vento students who are youth on their own. Okay, that's a lot of me talking there. So I do just wanna take a pause here and see how is everybody feeling? Questions, comments? Oh, there's a baby. Yay. Thank you, Katie. Um, questions or comments so far? Was this information that you knew? Is this new to you? Can you think of how it will connect with your students? I mean, I guess I can speak up. I'm currently working with a family with multiple children that are living in a tent in their yard. Um, so this was very helpful so far. Um, figuring out who their liaison is and knowing that even though they wouldn't describe themselves as homeless, like they still do fit in this and could potentially then get $750 that might help them towards repairing the electricity in their house so that hopefully they can move back into it. Yes, absolutely. And it's $750 per student. So if they have two kids, that's $1,500. And then I don't know math above that, but yeah, thank you for sharing, Christine. All right, uh, let's see. Teresa says, very helpful, very new. Wish I had this information when I was doing case management. Yes, new information, very helpful. Okay, great. Any other comments or thoughts right now? Then I have a few more slides I can jump into. Okay. All right, so... One part of this that we, that we do talk about as kind of a subpopulation in McKinney-Vento is our unaccompanied students. This does not have anything to do with immigration, right? This is not unaccompanied minor status, blah, blah, courts, nothing like that. This is just kids who are on their own, who are not in the physical custody of a legal parent or guardian, right? And so for our definition, if students are not in the physical custody of a legal parent or guardian and McKinney-Vento eligible, then they'll be an unaccompanied homeless youth where they have some extra particular rights to their education. Even if they are a minor, they can make decisions about their general education. They can consent to their own medical care. Do you guys know this one? This one's huge. If, um, if you are an unaccompanied homeless youth, you can consent to your own medical care, even without a parent uh, signature or sign off or anything. That's a relatively new law that came out, I think, 2019 in our state. Um, and so we also have like a caregiver form. So a lot of times we'll have a student who is staying with friends and their friend's parent. Um, that friend's parent could sign off to be a caregiver for the child with the school. This is not an official court document. This does not any financial obligation. This is just saying I can be contacted. Um, if the child is sick and needs to be picked up, right? Or I can contact the school about these kinds of general education pieces. Um, so that's a resource we have. And then this is the consent to medical care language in that statute. And we have a form that goes along with this that liaisons can provide um, that shows a student is unaccompanied homeless. But it's also um, like a homeless, like a shelter could also provide that documentation. And so when we look at potential signs of homelessness, I mean, you all are really, really lucky because you're building these relationships in a, such a unique way that a lot of schools don't have insight to. And you get to do home visits, right? That's the best part of any job. <laughs> and so you have this very unique perspective into the home lives of students and families that you work with that schools often don't get to see. But also how this might show up at school is um, children who are in public places during the school day, like public libraries is a big partner of ours to try to be able to better get those kids who are hanging out in libraries into school. Um, but things that we talked about with our example, like unmet hygiene needs, wearing the same clothes, um, falling asleep in class, right? These all may be signs that something else is going on at home. And so the key is really to take this 
to take this information and if something pops up for you to share that with your local liaison and give them a heads up. And ideally they would say, yep, they're already on my radar. No worries, got them taken care of. But they might say, wow, I had no idea. Thank you for telling me this, right? And particularly for our unaccompanied homeless youth, this one, the question I get all the time is um, some variation of why should we encourage, it? it's like this child just doesn't wanna follow their parents' rules why should we encourage their bad behavior, right? And my answer and the research and the evidence and all of it shows kids don't up and leave for no reason. And the, the realities of the harm that's very often happening in homes um, is, is so, so sad, right? Um, I used to have a slide with the statistics and I was like this, I, I don't know how to bounce us back from this. <laughs> It was just too depressing, right? Of the abuse, the substance use, and the disagreements and all of that that can lead to children being on their own, right? We don't know if the family rule is don't talk about the abuse, don't talk about the substance use, don't be gay, don't be pregnant, right? There's a lot of rules that are rules that we wouldn't agree are rules, right? And so when we talk about youth who are on their own, it's really, really important. We are only looking at where are they currently sleeping. We are not looking at why are they currently sleeping there because we don't have we we don't have that information. We will never have that information. If we are concerned about abuse or neglect, yes, let's make a mandated report. We absolutely should do that. But McKinney Venta status alone is not abuse or neglect, first of all, um, and a student who is couch surfing, regardless of what choices we think they may have available to them, is couch surfing. And that is not an adequate nighttime residence, right? So you may run into schools who disagree with your evaluation of a situation, right? Um, if that happens, you can always give me a call. I do a lot of, um, what is it called? Pre-dispute mediation between folks who disagree on what the interpretation of the law is, right? And so I'm more than more than happy to join any of those conversations or questions if you get any pushback on um, eligibility. It's just kind of a little tangent rant for you. Um, but the other piece of what do we do once we hear something might indicate eligibility, right? I, I don't think I need to um, go over this too much with you all and your experiences. But it really is just, you know, how would you want to be treated if you were in one of these situations, right? It's a very vulnerable, uh, very vulnerable place. And a lot of families don't want to talk about it and are concerned about DHHS involvement in disclosing these things, right? So how do we make sure that our conversation is coming from a compassionate place, that we're avoiding using the word homeless, and that we're explaining why we have questions if we have those questions, right? And and one key that I learned from the Youth Action Board that I say every time that like gets my gets me in my gut when I say it is youth do not owe you their stories, right? And especially for us in education or with DHHS, like we get in this place of thinking that we are going to know everything and that we're going to be able to resolve these situations. But it is so, so important to remember that we are not owed any of this, right? And all we are we are here to do is to be another caring adult in their life that is passing them along to the resources to which they are entitled, right? And we might not know the whole story and we're not entitled to it. So the key takeaways, avoid using the word homeless, keep an eye out for anything that might indicate that a student may be in a temporary or inadequate living situation. Remembering that most of our students are qualified because they are doubled up, right? A lot of a lot of folks, when I first started doing this, would say, oh, we don't have homelessness in our community because we take care of our own, right? Taking care of our own means sharing housing due to a loss of housing. It would definitely qualify under our definition. Um, recognizing there's a lot of support out there for McKinney Vento. So get to know your local liaison. Um, to be able to connect them to these resources so the children can succeed in school and get access to this $750. Like that really changes the way I talk about this program because that's such a concrete thing um, where the schools can pay for a service that is that home repair, utilities, or rental assistance, 
right? So they're not going to give a, a family a check directly for $750, but they can pay something directly on behalf of that family. And so one quick reminder, information is not implementation. So I really, really want to ask you all, how can you please, please help getting the word out on this? Can we post some flyers in your spaces? Can we put up posters? Can you get to know your local liaison? Are there others that you know that could benefit from having this information? And how can we all work together to really make sure that all of our students are getting the support to which they are entitled? And then I have some more links for you that I will pop into the chat.